You're listening to Kayak Flyer with your host, Sean. Tonight, we're brought to you by Tennessee Trailers, OutdoorAdventureTrailers.com. Simply the best way to get your kayak to and from the water. Bajuco Flats Flyco. Simply the best custom-made fly rods on the market. Always built to order just the way you want it. Find Bajuco Flats Flyco on Instagram and Facebook. Stoneflynets.com, made 100% in the great state of Arkansas with your choice of woods or burls. Stonefly Nets can even be customized for that favorite fisher person in your life. Check out Stoneflynets.com for details. Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, the only leaders that I fish with. Cutthroat Furled Leaders are excellent for saltwater, freshwater, trout, bass, you name it, you can catch it with a Cutthroat Furled Leader. Head to Cutthroatfurledleaders.com, promo code KAYAK to save 15%. Man, third time's the charm. Let's hope this all works out. We have had technical difficulties upon technical difficulties before we get too far in, I wanted to give a big shout out to uh, friends of mine in their podcast, and that's the Essential Outdoorsman. You can catch them live on Facebook on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. Central. That is the Essential Outdoorsman. One of those guys, um, Jeff Tatum, good friend of mine, 19 Delta Baits, makes some great crankbaits, but we're not going to be talking about crankbaits tonight, Adam. Um, I've got my personal friend and uh, weekend warrior fishing buddy, Nick Chiberia, who just happened to go down and win his second ever Hobie BOS, and he came in first place down Lake Darnell, Arkansas. Nicky, buddy, how you doing? Doing well. Let's hope this. Uh, let's hope this holds up. But uh, excited to be uh, be back on, and um, you know, I called you as soon as I won, and told you I was going to have a busy podcast schedule. You know. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. And uh, matter of fact, uh, we were on the phone together on sunday night when you won and after you won we were all texting back and forth in the big group chat and uh monday you called me and you're like hey i'm gonna have a bunch of podcasts coming up and i'm like yeah whatever and then you were on one that night you were on a live one and luckily this is your third time with us first time with you and adam both together um and nikki man you know you you never had a kayak until you got to hanging around me that, that's a true story. You know, I guess, uh, you know, you could take a little credit for, uh, for the win here, partial credit, but yeah, keep uh, it partial, yeah, Nick. Nick. watch out, man. He's going to swoop in this guy. Don't let him fool you. He's going to, he's going to, hey, I'm, not, I'm not signing any contracts with him. You know, I'm not putting my name <laughs> on anything. You know, it's, it's sort of like, why did the chicken cross the road? It's why did the Jabaria get a kayak to show Sean that he didn't have to fall out? <laughs> yeah. You know? You know, it's funny. I, I always just expected to get wet whenever you're in a kayak, just, you know, based on watching Sean, Sean float. But uh, turns out you can't actually stay dry. <laughs> turns out there are ways to get things done without completely messing it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't help when your buddy Grant climbs halfway onto my kayak to get away from a shark and throws me into the water. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's always something. It, it'll always be something. <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, Nick, uh, I'm not overly familiar. I mean, we've had Drew on here and uh, we've had Christine Fisher on here. So we know what the Hobie BOS is, but I don't think all of us, or at least some of us fly guys or got non-tournament guys know this is a major, a major event, uh, more than just a club event or things like that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Hobie BOS and how you got into going to these, this being your second one ever? Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is definitely kind of on that national circuit, you know, semi-pro kind of level. Um, they, uh, I think they put on, I think about seven or eight tournaments a season, um, about once a month, all over the country, the lakes rotate. Um, you know, it's a two day event, which is a big deal for, for those who, who don't tournament fish. Um, you know, it's quite, it's, quite different than then coming out for one day and, and whacking them for a day, but, but coming out for two and trying to manage your fish and manage your spots that adds, adds a whole other element. So, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit steeper entry fee compared to your, your, your local club tournaments. Um, I, you know, I think it's like two sixty or two seventy to enter the, for the two days, but absolutely fantastic tournament. Um, I, I've been to two, so not too much to go on compared to some of these guys, but, um, you know, always run, uh, you know, very professionally and, um, you know, just kind of no question, this is one of the premier kayak uh, bass fishing tournaments in the country right now, no doubt about that. So 
I uh, I actually went down to Dardanelle um, kind of just to, to hang out with an old buddy from Louisiana, my old buddy Andy Green from my first, uh, you know, it was my, he was part of my first um, kayak bass fishing club, the Bam Bassin, who I'm representing here. But um, anyways, we uh, we met up last year in Kentucky for uh, Hobie BOS, and he was coming up from, from Louisiana. He fishes quite a bit of these national events. And, uh, you know, Arkansas is about halfway for both of us. Great excuse to hang out and uh, just wound up being one of those weekends. Does he still talk to you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, so, we're, I mean, he, he, dude, it was awesome. Like, he, he had a great tournament as well. He was top 20 finished. He was top 10 for after the first day. And uh, the dude, I mean, talk about elevating your fishing game. You know, when I started fishing with Bam and, and against him in a lot of these local tournaments down in Louisiana – I mean, instantly I was like, wow, I really need to step it up here. <laughs> like these guys flat out can whack them, you know, in, in a lot of different circumstances. So, um, you know, but yeah, no, he was, uh, dude, he was so supportive the whole weekend. And uh, like I said, this is kind of his thing, um, you know, going to these national events. But, you know, when, when, when I was, you know, had a shot for it, um, you know, I, he couldn't be happier. So it was awesome to have him there and, and just have the support uh, on site. And as well as you guys back home, I had a lot of support. Um, as well from friends and, and family back home. So I appreciate that. But yeah, man, it was, it was, it was a fun weekend to say the least. Yeah. We were all excited that you were going down to have a good time. And that, that Saturday night, when we get the text message saying that you're basically second, because there's a three-way tie for first, you know, it's like, Oh, he could really do this now. And, you know, you're a power fisherman. And Adam, I don't know how you like to fish. I like to put on one fly and leave it all day long. Something's going to get it. Um, but Nick, if, it, if the lure is not working, he's changing. I've seen him go through his whole tackle box in 45 minutes. But you stayed on the same bait uh, the entire time, entire time down at Lake Darnell. Um, can you talk about maybe something you did that some other folks weren't doing or maybe what some of the other guys that got in the top five were doing that were maybe similar or different from you? Yeah, you know, um, I got down to Dardanelle uh, on Thursday night. Um, you know, I was going to pre-fish a little bit on Friday, um, and we had some rain moving in Friday as well. So, you know, before I got down there, um, I did a lot of map study, kind of looking at Navionics, um, depth changes, and then just Google Earth and Google Maps and things like that, and found a couple areas that I thought might hold them. You know, I thought I was pretty keyed in on the bass up here uh, in Missouri, at least, just kind of where they were in the spawn and uh, what, what they were kind of doing with the, we were still having some pretty cold nights as, as you guys know, if you're around here. So um, anyways, yeah, I went, went to my first spot on, on Friday in practice. Um, and uh, that wound up being the deal the whole weekend. Um, you know, I love throwing a chatter bait. It's something I have a ton of confidence in. It's a, it's a bait that I'll really fish year round um, at least, you know, spring, summer, fall, and really just kind of change up the trailer to match what I'm, what I'm fishing. So anyways, um, you know, got, I had one one fish early in my practice day come up and follow my chatterbait, probably a 19 or 20, um, you know, and swipe at it. And I shook it off. Um, but, you know, it's always a good sign when they're when they're really chasing the bait like that. You know, it's not just a reaction strike. They're actually wanting to eat it. Um, kept fishing around that area. And uh, I wound up landing to 17. Um, again, not that I was trying to really catch a ton of fish the day before the tournament, but just wanted to get my hands on one and kind of, you know, see what they were doing. So anyways, I had a couple other bites that I shook off in that area and I, you know, I was there for about two hours total and you know, I was like, that's it. You know, this is probably going to be the deal. I mean, four bites in two hours, you, you, your goal is to fill your five fish limit each day. And so that's a pretty good indication that you'll be able to do that there. So I checked out a couple other spots, nothing else really produced. I only launched in two more spots, fish for maybe an hour and a half total, more and then drove around and checked out some other um, areas that, 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 you know, I, I found on the map, but going into it, you know, Saturday came and, and I had that, that one area and, and really for the lack of not having anywhere else to go, that was going to be it. And um, it wound up, it wound up holding the right fish and it wound up holding them for two days straight, which uh, I know is, is pretty unusual. So I feel fortunate in yeah. that sense. Well, you were saying too, before we were <clears throat> attempting before all of our technical difficulties, there were the water conditions were somewhat unexpected, right? In terms of, you mentioned the weather moving in, then also they were, uh, the, the, the lake was getting, that was much lower than you had anticipated too. So you had to fight through that as well, right? Yeah, and it was just one of those things that, you know, everything in the conventional book of, of bass fishing will tell you that cold nights, we had we had Friday and Saturday night, the nights got down into the low 40s when we, you know, and stayed there even when we launched, warmed up to about, uh, you know, high 50s um, during the day, but um, 
And, you know, so, so cold nights. And then also they, they dropped the lake on the weekends, which I, I didn't know. So probably from Friday to Sunday at the end of tournament, the water probably came down about a foot and a half, two feet. Um, stuff that I, you know, thought looks good on Friday um, in, in practice with, you know, it's kind of some, some reeds or um, some like buck brush up against the bank. Um, you know, it was then it, it just wound up, the, the water wound up pulling back and it was just kind of a big, big mud flat almost or muddy bank. Um, you know, so yeah, you know, everything would tell you that the fish would, would pull out. Um, and that, but that was one of the, the, one of the key spots that I found or what I was keen on was some of those, those shallow banks, but where there was deeper water nearby and deep being relative, like the area I was in, I think the probably deep was probably like six feet. So not, you know, crazy deep, but somewhere where these fish could move up and down, um, you know, maybe when the water came down or when the water cooled off, but yeah, they, for me, they, they were, they were up dirt shallow and, you know, six inches or less pretty much all weekend. Uh, Nick, I'm not going to diminish your win by any stretch of the imagination because I've seen you whip my hind in and our friends together on uh, the river or lake in one day. I mean, you know what you're doing, but you're out there with a bunch of guys with a lot of equipment and a lot of money thrown on those boats. Um, a lot of the fish finders, the live views, you know, I mean, a lot of things like that. How was it to to not only know that was going to be what you were after. And and like we said, you went to have a good time. You wound up winning. Um, how does that really, how do you as, as a person look at that as how important are those avionics and how important is just being a good fisherman? Well, look, you know, uh, the field, you know, is absolutely stacked and, you know, it's kind of funny because I do follow a lot of these national tournaments. You know, I don't get to fish as many as I want, you know, simply because you're normally driving, you know, seven plus hours to get there. And that's that's like the closest ones on the year. You know, you could be traveling a lot more um, and obviously work commitments and other things. So, um, you know, just kind of seeing the field. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're 100 you're percent right. I, I went to hang out with a buddy. I told him on Thursday night my goal was to catch. 10 fish total that weekend, five each day. You know, that was what I was after. If I catch a limit, I, I would have improved from my, you know, previous Hobie BOS, which, you know, where I did it uh, both days. So yeah, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it's humbling and it's exciting all at the same time. Um, I'm fishing out of the new canoe Flint this season. Um, this is my first season with it. Um, about my third time having it on the water, first tournament in it. And um yeah, I'll tell you, man, it, it kind of goes back to how, you know, I got started into kayaking, kayak fishing, and, and you know, you were there. I mean, you know, we we were floating the, you know, the Ozark Rivers, the Ozark Streams here in Missouri, and, you know, just out to have a good time and, and catch fish. So, you know, the thing that I really liked about kayaking when I got into it and kayak fishing was the simplicity of it. Not taking a bunch of crap you don't need, not sinking a ton of money into it, having the portability. I mean, you know, I, I was living in an apartment at the time when I, um, you know, got my first kayak. I was able to store it easily. I didn't have a, you know, big trailer or boat or anything to, to try to uh, fit. So, you know, I still really enjoy the simplicity of it. And I'm not going to sit here and say that, that you know, graphs and fish finders and motors and pedals aren't going to come into play in other tournaments. I've been, I've, you know, my, I've got my butt kicked plenty of times in, in you know, all different kinds of conditions. Um but, you know, in this particular instance, I think having the light paddle boat that I can get super shallow in and, um, and, and another benefit was long, I was able to launch roadside, not have to go to the crowded ramp. I, I mean, I, I beat guys to spots that I know they wanted to fish. Um, somebody made a comment to me on Sunday. I was sitting out there, you know, we, we can launch. I think it was at like 545. First cast was at 615. So you get to your spot and you can sit and, and you know, do your thing. But anyways, I got out there and, and somebody came from, you know, about a quarter, half mile from uh, farther down where the ramp was and like, Oh, you must've found the secret, you know, secret ramp. And I was like, no, just put it under that bridge, you know, just dragged it across the rocks. No problem there. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it, there's certain advantages to, to, to different, you know, equipment and kayaks and uh, you know, this weekend it just kind of all shaped up to, to fish to my strengths. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, a kayak, I mean, you, you talk to some folks and you know, you can put, everything well look at your buddy i mean he just got that boat inflatable you know and he's got that bixby motor on it and it's like dude it's not even a kayak anymore it's a skiff you know i mean so you know i mean there's there's pros and cons on all of it having the ability to get in get where you need to be um you know that's what kayaking's about you know but 
I'll give you a tip. Don't say the name of the kayak you used again until they pay you each time you say it. <laughs> hey, no, I mean, in all seriousness, um, it, it really was a great boat and I'm, I'm excited to, to get more, to get more, uh, experience on it and use it. And, um, yeah, I think it certainly has its place, you know, in, in tournament fishing. And I tried to talk you out of that boat and gave you four different alternatives. <laughs> I, and I don't know. I just had, like I said, it kind of, it kind of, it, it kind of fits my strengths. It's simplistic. It's, you know, no, not too many frills, but it has everything you need. And you know, I'm not, I'm not just saying that just cause you know, <laughs> of, uh, of what it is, but no, it, it uh, yeah. Like I, like I said, it was just a fortunate weekend. Everything came together and uh, you know, to kind of put the, the pieces into place um, Saturday and Sunday, it was, it was certainly special. What's your confidence level moving forward? Cause I know, you're invited to the big dance, um, but you need to fish what another two tournaments, really honestly, to get ready for that. Are you thinking about fishing one or two more? Yeah, this definitely um, you know kind of changes uh, things for me kayak fishing wise. You know, I, I had really only kind of planned to fish you know maybe one or two national events just that were close that I could easily get to. Um, you know, but they do it with Hobie for the BOS series. They do take your top three finishes for Angler of the Year. Um, and I mean, there's obviously some very stiff competition this year. Like the, the, the guy who took second at Dardanelle um, already had a win on the year as well. So, um, you know, obviously, these, like I said, these guys are some hammers and, you know, and they, you know, this is what they do. So, um, but certainly, you know, this kind of uh, gives me a little more motivation to get out there. And uh, yeah, I mean, just from a confidence standpoint, I mean, like you said, it's really just kind of eye opening because I mean, you know, I think as an angler, you can go out and have a good day and be excited. But, you know, when it comes to competing, that, that's kind of a different story and you really don't know where you sit. And again, I'm not saying that this, you know, this means that I'm obviously better than than, than those hundred and you know twenty three guys. And, and but, uh, you know, on this particular weekend and, and, you know, was able to kind of figure them out. So um, it definitely does give you a little bit of a confidence boost and just kind of shows that, um, you know, OK, maybe, maybe you, you start listening to yourself a little bit more. Right. You stop second guessing your, your choices and and, um, you know, kind of kind of stick with your gut a little bit more. On yeah, the water. So w- walk me through that. Like at what point, you know, on Saturday or maybe it wasn't until Sunday that you really felt super confident. But like, you know, you're fine. You're dialing in. You obviously know where to go. You're beating guys out to particular spots, which is a good sign, right? Like they, they clearly want to be fishing those same places. So how far into the day or how far into your limit did you kind of feel like, man, I, I might be putting something together here to make a good run at this thing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and you know, it's, again, just again, not being my second national event, I don't think I really felt comfortable like throughout the whole thing until it was over, <laughs> you know, until, until my name, you know, my name was called and I knew where I was at. Um, like I said, I mean, there's just so much talent out there and, um, but what, what kind of keyed me in? So again, going back to Friday, I had an idea where I was going to fish. I, I had those two kind of one, one big bite and one, one, you know, good fish that I landed. Um, you know, I knew the fish were in the area and I knew at least I, you know, I was kind of maybe in the, in, in the right, um, you know, in some of the right spots. So, my very first fish on uh, Saturday is about seven o'clock, about uh, forty-five minutes after first cast. Um, you know, I was fishing some of that grass up shallow, um, right near deeper water, and uh, my first bite. You know, just saw my line swimming away, set the hook, and it wound up sticking. Wound up being a twenty-inch fish, which, um, you know, for, for for kind of tournament purposes, I mean, this is very a very loose comparison, but generally, like a twenty-inch bass in a kayak tournament would be like catching a five-pounder if you're going by weight. Again, not saying that that's how it shakes out exactly, but, you know, quality of fish and what it takes to win, that's, you know, that you're, that's a good start. So that got me fired up, of course, right away. Uh, but then I went probably like two and a half, three hours without a bite um, after that. And again, you know, because I'm still trying to figure out because he was up shallow, but, um, you know, right near deeper water. But again, I knew that water was dropping. So there wasn't really a lot of options for that around the area I was fishing. Then about, I think like 10, 15 or 10, 20 or so, um, I, I pass a, another kayaking where we're kind of, you know, going different ways. And I was fishing closer to the bank and he was pulled out. And, um, you know, so I was basically going into water that he already hit. But I was, you know, I don't know, maybe like 10 yards shallower than he was thrown up in like six inches of water. And so I, I threw up super shallow, saw a fish come out and wake after my chatterbait. 
And I was like, and, you know, caught it. And I think I wound up calling that one later. It's like a 15 and a half. But I was like, okay, this could be a thing. Like when they're that aggressive, that shallow, you know, that kind of keyed me in to like, I need to be throwing as shallow as I can get. And that's what I did the rest of the day. I hit similar spots to where I had caught those two, again, with kind of deeper water nearby, but real shallow areas and was just casting basically right off the bank. And, uh, you know, they would see them wake or, or, you know, they would, they would hit soon after that. So that's when I felt like I had something going, but then again, you know, we're talking about a two day tournament here. So, you know, you can, you can have a great day. And, and I even joked with, with Sean and the guys Saturday was, was, I mean, it took my two best kayak tournament days ever to win this. I mean, by length, those are my two best days I've ever had. And so I even joked with him. I said, I just, guys, I just had the best day of, you know, fishing my life. Now I just need it to happen again tomorrow. <laughs> And, um, but, you know, fishing the two day, you know, just kind of real quick. So at the end of Saturday, I think at like one thirty, I caught a 17, which called like a 15 something. So, um, at that point, you know, about one thirty, last cast was three. I was feeling pretty good about the limit I had and not, not that I was like confident that was going to be a winning limit or, you know, put me in contention, but just knowing that I really had nowhere else to go on Sunday, I needed to start kind of managing those fish. So after I caught that 17 at 130, um, I started fishing around trying to eliminate water for Sunday because I knew I was going to be back in that area, general area, but I wanted to start getting rid of, you know, not where areas where I wasn't getting bit. I knew I wouldn't waste time there on Sunday. So heading back to the ramp, I went into this, um, you know, this little pocket that I knew got hammered all day. This was about 1230. So half hour left of fishing on Saturday. And, you know, I was, I was throwing the same pattern, ch- chatterbait, super shallow. And I got back to back bites. I shook the bass. I shook them off, but back to back cast, I got bit. And I was like, okay, this area got hammered all day long. I'm still getting bit in the afternoon. Maybe I've got something that other people around me aren't throwing. Did you get a chance to talk to anybody else and see what they were? Th- I mean, is, and I don't want you to give away anybody's secrets, but what were some of the, you know, the two, three, four or five guy, were they throwing something similar to you or were they working a totally different rig? Well, I don't, I don't know if anybody else was on the chatter bait, but I think I, I did from the way and I heard a couple people talk about fishing a similar pattern, like super shallow where they were like those reeds and they, you know, they were, uh, you know, submerged or emergent earlier in the week. But then when the water dropped, you know, it was just kind of a muddy bank and they were, you know, they were essentially on the bank now, but again, it was kind of that, that muddy kind of looked like nothing bank that was seemed to be holding those fish. So, you know, like my buddy and I, I'm guessing a lot of people did this is when the water was up during the week and practice, I think there was a really good flipping bite in those reeds, you know, when, when they were, when it was in like a half foot, foot, foot of water, right. I mean, you know, fish would want to be up shallow. They're starting to stage, I didn't, you know, didn't run any bloody tails or spawners, but definitely starting pre-spawn to stage. And uh, so I think there was a really good flipping bite. And then when that water dropped, you know, I think that, you know, maybe got a lot of people confused and, and it it had me kind of questioning it too, because I caught that 20 on Saturday in kind of where they probably were set up all week, but then the water was down. So I kind of had to figure it out on the go. So um, I'm not exactly sure if anyone else is on the chatter, but it seemed like there were quite a few, finesse style just like um you know throwing worms or jigs but for me i i threw a lot of stuff too and they they really just wanted it moving and they seemed to want a bigger profile um and you know and that's kind of what i stuck to all weekend yeah you know that's well uh, grant and i were crappie fishing this weekend and you know uh a squirmy wormy was not having it they wanted to chase and crappie wanting to chase uh streamers small streamers but streamers nonetheless so you know it's always interesting when you're in that really shallow water and they're hiding out underneath some moss or hiding out near some some structure and you're just swimming a a shallow streamer or in this case your chatterbait and what they blow up on versus what you've always come to think i've got to throw a jig for crappie and they weren't having a jig at all you know, Adam, you've had those days on the water too, where it's the last thing you would throw would be what's catching and nobody will believe you when you tell them what you're using. Yeah, no kidding. I, I'm definitely that guy too, that <clears throat> I'll, you know, I'll change out flies constantly. If it's been not hitting them after 10, 15 minutes, I, I will continually change to your point about, you know, going through everything in your tackle box in terms of fly fishing. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. That's why the whole, the whole box is just full of all sorts of different different things just just to be prepared as possible but 
you know, when you find something that works, why change from it? And clearly it paid out in dividends for you to win the whole thing. Yeah. And that's, it's kind of a great, you know, this is, that's why I love tournaments partly because in it, for people who don't fish tournaments, it's just a great, something to take away is, um, you know, cause you know, when you're kind of fun fishing or going out to relax, you might get stuck, you know, in your old habits, throwing what you think should work or what you think they should be biting on. But when you're fishing these tournaments, it forces you to make adjustments, right? You have to catch your fish within a certain time frame. You don't have time to, you know, sit there and, and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, hope that the bite turns on. So, um, yeah, for anyone who doesn't fish tournaments, you know, maybe if, if you haven't treat a day of fishing, like it is a tournament and you might be surprised that, you know, the kind of the adjustments you can make and, and what you can do. And clubs are a great way for people to get into this too. If they're not, and some clubs obviously are more relaxed than others, but that's a great way to get into a tournament style fishing where maybe it's not your pace to go and do that, but you want to try it. So why not? You know, and I know there are several around. I'm sure, Adam, you've got well, average Joes up there. They can put you in the Kansas City area in with those. Or you just get on any of your Facebooks. The one down in Louisiana, Bama Bassin, did you say it was? Uh, Bam, B-A-M. B-A-M. B-A-M, yep. not Bama. No. <laughs> they, they, don't, they, don't like, uh, they don't like Bama down in Louisiana. I know. Uh, I'm telling you what. Oh, but yeah, I mean, there's some great places where you can get to know how to do some of this stuff, and it really changes how you fish. I think, you know, and just your daily fishing, when you go out on a fishing trip with the guys, it sort of changes stuff because now you're flipping through and you're sort of the expert because you know how to change these baits and how to work them and see where they go. Yeah, it uh, it just adds a whole whole other element. And look, obviously, you know, it's some guys, uh, you know, just enjoy fun fishing or doing it for, for relaxation. And I can tell you this, this isn't quite it. Um, you know, if that's the case, but, um, yeah, it just, to me, for, for me, it just kind of forces me to, to be a better angler and that carries over into, into those fun days, you know, when, when you're just messing around. So how much would you say fishing in Louisiana? I mean, you mentioned, you know, how the bass look like tailing redfish, how much fishing in Louisiana do you think? Because I know when you left compared to when you came back, your bass fishing was totally, totally different and much more aggressive. How did that change you? Yeah, I, and it just kind of go. I mean, it just Louisiana was was great to to expand kind of my my fishing knowledge and, and experience really. Um, but just any anywhere you can get out of you know your your kind of local areas or you know kind of that water that you're always used to. If you can get out and fish other areas, it's only going to help. Um, you know, like I said, it fishing, to, it, like these bass almost set up, like they were in the marsh, um, you know, Louisiana marsh where it was those, those just kind of muddy looks like nothing banks, but, but they were holding them. And I, I'd caught them that way. I caught them that way down there before, you know, when I went back and thought about it, I was like, wow, this was pretty similar. So, you know, having that experience, I probably would never have thrown a lure where I did this weekend if I hadn't fished down there. And, you know, maybe to, to, to you know, my fault, uh, you know, a fault of my own that I, you know, kind of didn't expand my my thinking, but, um, yeah, it, it certainly helped to have that experience. And yeah, it was a lot of it, you know, was kind of like red fishing. Um, you know, they'd see them wake after it and, 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 you know, wait a little bit and set the hook and, and they were right there. So, um, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, overall it's just, it just couldn't have set up better that weekend, you know, the way the fish were, were holding. Good deal. So, uh, what, uh, what are the other two that you're looking at as far as tournaments and when are they? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of eyeing, there's, there's one up in the cross Wisconsin in, um, I think it's in August. And then there's one down in uh, Pickwick in Tennessee, um, in September. So, uh, those are logistically probably like the two easiest for me to get to. I mean, they're going to, um, Sam Rayburn, I think this coming, no, 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 sorry. Lake Hartwell in North Carolina, I think this coming weekend. And then Sam Rayburn after that. So, I mean, like I said, this, the series gets all over. So lots of opportunities, anywhere in the country to, you know, to take part in one and, um, you know, kind of like, like, kind of like me, you never know what's going to shake out if you go. So, um, yeah, but lacrosse and, and probably Pickwick. And then of course they, so, uh, part of, uh, the top three from each of these, you know, kind of regular season events qualifies for the tournament of champions, which rotates, um, yearly, but this year it's down at Lake Eufaula in uh, Alabama in October. So that one's, uh, obviously on the calendar and on the radar now, I, I'm not exactly sure the payout structure, but, I think the pod is like $75,000 for that one. It's 50 guys qualify. So, um, you know, I got to take your shot at this point, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you got to lose at this yeah. point in time? I mean, you, you had a great day on the water and, you know, like we were talking about, it's, it's nobody's dissing any other fisherman. I mean, we've got, you know, you're the third 
winner from, you know, the BOS to be on the podcast, even though you were on here long before you were a winner, um, back when you were just a wiener. Um, <laughs> speaking of, I picked up some brats the other day and I thought about you. Um, but yeah, dude, this has got to be like a, a, a surreal moment. You've been riding this for a straight two weeks. Um, do you walk up to people now and introduce yourself as a professional bass fisherman? <laughs> Not quite. You know, it's, oh man, it really was surreal. And, and just the finish too. Um, and we, we talked about it a little bit, but, um, you know, so on that second day, uh, you know, I caught him pretty early. I got, um, I got a limit, I think in like the first hour, which is, you know, unheard of for me, had a couple of fish that I knew I needed to get rid of, but, um, you know, wound up kind of grinding that whole day. And anyways, kind of fast forward, um, to about 140, well, about 130, I was kind of in my area, wasn't, uh, wasn't getting bit, um, you know, knew I needed to make a move or figure something out. I had hit my spots kind of four times at that point. So I didn't know if the fit, you know, just fished out those areas or what, but anyways, made, wound, wound up making my way back to the ramp or back to the roadside where I launched and was going to fish around there, new water for me, but I know it had gotten hit pretty hard all weekend. And, um, anyways, just didn't, didn't like what I was seeing around there. Um, you know, so about 145 hour, hour 15 left to fish on the day I was sitting in second place by a quarter of an inch. Um, Brian Howell had a huge, huge day, put up the biggest, biggest bag of the weekend, um, to come from like, I think like somewhere in like 24th or something into first place on the second day. So, um, and, and you know, he, he already won an event this year. I mean, he's, he's, he's a big stick. So, um, you know, I knew I needed to make a move. I either could continue to fish that, that new water for me, but areas that I knew kind of got hit pretty hard or, you know, I was going to make the mile and a half paddle back into the wind, back to the area where I caught them all weekend and, you know, give myself a chance. So I was pretty down at that point. I hadn't had a keeper in like four hours, I think. And, uh, just knowing how close, I mean, look, I, I would have been happy with the second place finish any day, just cashing a check in that field is an accomplishment, but knowing how close I was, um, you know, quarter inch away, it, it would have kind of been a little bit heartbreaking, um, you know, to, to not give myself a chance. So, Again, you know, kind of just talking about kind of keeping it simplistic, made the paddle back to the areas I knew <laughs> through what I knew. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. When I was on my last spot, I was dead tired. Um, like I said, I hadn't really had a bite in a few hours. And uh, with 10 minutes left, the sun had finally come out for the first time all weekend and cast up under a bush, the chatterbait. And um, I see my line swimming out and set the hook and knew it was good. I had lost two fish Sunday as well. Um, one that would have helped my final weight, one that would have, um, you know, maybe, maybe helped, but anyway, so I was kind of kicking myself for losing those fish, but set the hook and, um, you know, wound up getting, getting, getting a 17 in, which upgraded my total by a half inch, um, you know, to essentially put me a quarter inch in the lead. And they shut the leaderboard off within the last hour to kind of build suspense. So I didn't know if it would hold up. Um, you know, it seemed like the fishing had kind of slowed down for a lot of people, but man, to even just to even get the, the win in that way, I mean, it, like it still it still blows my mind to, to catch the fish that you need, you know, you know, in the last ten minutes. I mean, I've even like thought about it. If you go out and you're just fun fishing, like give yourself fifteen minutes to catch a, you know, fifteen or sixteen inch bass. I mean, it never it never happens. It never happens to me, you know. <laughs> but yeah. it's crazy. It's just crazy. That quarter of an inch mark was a big mark all weekend. I mean, wasn't the top five all a quarter of an inch apart? Yeah, top four was separated by uh, three quarters of an inch. So, you know, a quarter inch up or quarter inch uh, increments uh, from fourth place on. So super tight tournament. I think last year there, uh, I think that was when Drew, I th did he, yeah, he won it, but it was, it was on a tie and then they go to big bass after that. So, you know, the fishery produces, we've seen now in two tournaments and super close races, um, you know, again, which is just fortunate to get that to, to pull out the win. So yeah, it's still, you know, still, still kind of surreal. And it's funny trying to explain to folks outside the kayak fishing community, you know, really what it is and, and what it means. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people think I'm making a bigger deal about it than I am, but I'm excited. You man. should be excited. I'm man. It is a big deal. <laughs> I mean, it really is. You know, I obviously the, the kayak uh, fishing tournaments, the theme of this particular episode of our podcast with having you on here, but I'm curious you know, you got to make time to fish for fun too, right? Like you're not going to uh, be fishing all Hobie BOS the rest of the year. You've got a couple more that you're ready for, but you know, what else are you looking to in terms of other water you want to get to maybe over the course of the summer leading into the fall? 
Yeah, I mean, well, I'm definitely looking forward to getting on the water with Sean and the guys and, and floating our, our rivers. That's always a good time. And that's that's usually less floating and fishing and more drinking and, yeah, that's, you know, that's and shooting the right and all there, that. But, yeah. Uh, Not yeah, catching yeah. anything. We always eat good. Yeah, we, we eat good. And when, uh, you know, hey, we always wind up catching fish one way or the other, but it, it maybe takes a while to get there. You know, but uh, no, look, you know, that's I'm, I'm looking forward to that probably most. But other than that, yeah, I, you know, I try to get out when I can on the weekends for a half day or whatever and just put the kayak in the water and, and you know, go see what you can do. And kind of in St. Louis here, I'm, I'm limited to, uh, you know, kind of bigger waters that I'm close to. So I typically want to fish in a lot of the conservation reservoirs and, you know, smaller lakes and things like that. But those can be just as fun. And, you know, they're, they're great for kayaks. You know, again, talking about kind of the appeal to, to all kayakers or all fishermen is, you know, those areas, you know, you're not going to have too many big boats in there. They're not going to be flying at a hundred miles an hour. So it's kind of a good, good area. You know, any of those conservation lakes are usually good to just go and, and relax and, you know, catch some fish. You know, that's one thing that drives me nuts on bigger water or even like, um, I don't know if you've fished the, uh, St. Francis with it or not with us or not when those jet boats come up through there and they come around a corner and you're sitting there fishing and you've got to hurry up and move everything out of the way and then ride the wake, you know, I mean, there's, there's room in the lake for all of us, but you know, kayaks are there to get to places that the big boats can't get into or can't be running 95 miles an hour through. And, you know, that's, that's a whole different, you know, if you're, if you're on a boat, Hey, great. I'm glad you're there. Watch out for the little guy. You know what I mean? you're going to be winning, you know, Stacy Howell does it for a living. I mean, that's, it's dude, it's great, but the kayaks are for a different type of people, people that don't want to, or can't invest, you know, $50,000 into just a boat and trailer and another 60 or $70,000 in a truck to pull it. I mean, you know, your kayak is, is a nice kayak. It's not the most expensive kayak out there by far, um, especially not when you're looking at some of the Hobies and things like that, or, or the apex for sure. Um, and your rod and reels, I mean, you're not busting the bank on what a normal guy could, could afford to pick up, especially if he was single like you, but I mean, you're out there having fun and enjoying yourself and you're not spending 10, $15,000 a year doing it. Yeah. Again, you know, it's kind of simplicity for me is the name of the game. And, um, you know, over, you know, over the course of five years, since I've been kayak fishing, um, kind of developed a system that works for me. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of kayakers kind of do the same. So, um, you know, it's, you're right. And in, in talking about getting to those backwaters, that's, you know, when I, when I approach a new lake, like I did for Dardanelle, I, I, I don't think I looked at a single boat ramp, maybe like one or two, but I'm trying to find those areas, those little pull-offs on the side of the road or, you know, those back road, just kind of quick launches that I can get to. And again, that, that kind of goes to avoiding the crowd and avoiding the, the boats and the other kayakers. So um, that, yeah, that certainly is one of the advantages to having a, a light kayak, you know, I car top too, so I can pretty much get in and out of anywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, when you talk about having a kayak, that is, that is probably in my book, the number one advantage is to be able to get into those places boats can't. Nothing like tossing your kayak off a 20 foot bridge and then jumping in behind it. Right. <laughs> is that something you did? Uh, well, we may have, we may have done that out there on the caster once it's, it's too steep to walk down that hill, splash, jump. Sounds about right. Yeah. You know. it's kind of like something Eric oh, Jackson would yeah. do, just throw it over the bridge and just go for it. Right. You know, I have a feeling Eric Jackson's done that. I have a feeling he has done that. He's thrown the kayak over the waterfall and then he's jumped off the waterfall. Yeah, and he I lands think. in it perfectly. Um, right. Like, and then he's just, yes. Pew. He's so majestic. He is a very majestic. If you don't follow Eric Jackson on Instagram, you've got to. He is so majestic when he does those backflips off stuff and you know roaring white water. You know it's it's great. That's so. good. That's good. Oh, so Nikki, everything is lined up great for you. It looks good. Sounds like everything's going to go really well this summer, man. And we're definitely going to get together, Adam. You're going to have to come down here with us and fish with us and have some of these uh, riverside brats that uh. Nick cooks up, man. We have a great time. Sounds great, man. Yeah, I, I could be, I could be on board with that for sure. Yeah, it sounds like a like a Jack's Fork meetup is in order then. Uh, right? Yeah, Probably about halfway or yeah. Jack's Fork would be ideal. Um, Little Piney or Merrimack would be about the same. Those are all good rivers. Uh, we can get you onto something you don't normally catch, Nick, and that's trout. Yeah. Unless you're using corn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Oh, that was a funny story. Do you want to tell about the corn story at the park? <laughs> hey, man, it's it's all about adapting. So I know, but you, yeah. you go ahead. We uh, this was part of the uh, Department of Conservation's urban trout program. So uh, you know, for those that don't know, they stock you know a bunch of city lakes. I think what in uh, November, right? Yeah. And then it's uh, catch and release lures only until February first, and you can keep four a day uh, with your trout tags and whatever. So, anyways, we're, we're me, Sean, and Grant. We've got this big idea. Where it's like a Tuesday morning or something. Did you, did you take off of work or going to work? Yeah, I took off work. I just took off the whole day, man. I was drinking. It's a Tuesday morning, February first. Grant and I both work the afternoon shift, so we just wanted we got there before work. We're going to Rotary Rotary uh, Park in Jackson to go catch these stock trout these rainbow trout to, to cook up and so i get there in the morning and i think i was fishing with like mealworms i had no idea what i was doing i never caught a trout really in, in my life and, uh, and I mean, there's guys that, you're like this is how you do this right like i just oop. Okay. yeah yeah and there's guys out there i mean you know it's six in the morning it's cold it's february you know and they're they're gearing up ready to go and uh so i'm fishing with like mealworms it's just not cutting it i see guys like pulling them left and right and so I don't even I think I remember reading something online that like corn was the deal. So I, I packed up, ran to the grocery store at like seven in the morning, got a can of, of green giant uh, of sweet corn. And um, anyways, Grant and Sean show up. They're in their waders. I think they've got their flies out and they're going to they're going to finesse these fish that, you know, are getting lures thrown at them left and right. And uh, sure enough, the corn was the corn was the ticket. And I'm fishing next to these two who, who want, are trying to catch them on the flies and do it the right way. And. And I'm just, no, we didn't fly fish for long because we grabbed our spinning reels and your corn and we got after it. Yeah. We, we, we were throwing fish, but this is a, this is a thing you don't do. It's considered rude to throw back stalker trout, but when they're really small and you start throwing them back and you see that one guy who's got one trout and the one you threw back was bigger than he's got. And he gives you the stink eye, you know? <laughs> And then we're getting ready to pack up and leave. And these old boys have been creeping closer to us the entire day. <laughs> Talking to us about this. You're going to throw that one back? Yeah, it's not big enough. <laughs> and finally, they're like, oh, can we have your spot? We're like, yeah. And they're like, well, don't get up yet. Th these guys will come over here and poach your spot. You just stay right there till we get packed up and move over. <laughs> I think we gave them some corn after that. Too. Yes, we left yeah, them with just, our corn. Just left your can of Jolly Green and said, have at it, boys. And I can tell you that the that that pattern holds up. I caught him that way out in Forest Park here in St. Louis this February as well. So it's a it's a universal thing. The secret's out. Stock trout, you know, in the urban urban ponds, all they want is some sweet corn. <laughs> well, you were dipping those chatter baits in corn juice, weren't you? That was the <laughs> ticket. Yeah. Hey, I can't tell anyone about that. The bass loves corn too. <laughs> oh. Guys, we're going to cut a little bit short tonight because we've actually gone for like two hours with all the technical difficulty. Right. <laughs> and last week's podcast, an hour and 57 minutes. Ooh. Man, Jack Dennis. Guys, if you haven't read his book, uh, you can still go over to the YouTube page and watch the uh, podcast with Jack Dennis. He's giving away three books, and I'm giving away three cutthroat furled leaders over there. I will tell you what, if you will comment... Um, let's see, where do we want to do a comment on this? Let's do this on the, the, uh, Facebook page. Let's do a comment on the Facebook page. I'll say, uh, something about Nick Chiberia, um, Hobie Bass Fishing. You guys comment and let us know, uh, what you think of the show, what you think about this style of interview with, uh, you know, some guys who are real winners, you know, uh, two winners and a loser is what we're going to call this from now on. And, uh, <laughs> Not you, Adam, me. Um, I'll be the loser. <laughs> That's about right. Here we go. Uh, but comment, and we'll send out a cutthroat for old leader one, to one lucky winner, if that sounds good. Uh, Adam, we're going to we're gonna have to get some things together because we've got Women, Wine, and Waiters coming up uh, next week. They'll be on, and then it looks like the week after that, we're going to have Ben Tut back on to talk with one of his favorite charities. Nikki, this has been absolutely amazing, dude. Put in your brat order this week. I'm stopping to pick some up. I will. I will. Thanks for having me back. And, uh, you know, really appreciate the support throughout the weekend. It it meant a lot having some uh, some guys, you know, watching from back home and cheering me on. Hey, you're always welcome. We're going to get you that kayak flyer jersey to wear yeah. to all your new events. So I will, we're going to ha happily wear it until, uh, you know, you get an FCC warning or something. And then we'll have to... <laughs> 
This never goes over the air that you can pick up with an antenna. So the FCC has no regulation, man. All right. We've the already N discussed this. The NSC then or the FBI or something. <laughs> it's the ATF we got to worry about. That's where I got to that's where I got to draw. But no man, I, I uh, I'll gladly uh, gladly take a jersey one. <laughs> yeah. You got one. Yeah. Alcohol, tobacco and fishing. I say yes, please. <laughs> Sign me up. You know. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys, this is Sean with Adam. We'll hit you next week with Women, Wine, and Waiters. You're going to want to catch that. Bring your girlfriend or your wife along to listen to that show, man. You guys are going to love it. It's a great way for girls to get out, experience the outdoors, and we're very happy to have them on. Nick Chiberia, Lake Darnell, Hobie BOS champion, and my good friend. Guys, we will talk to you next week.